James 3, verse 13 to 18. James 3, verse 13 reads, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Lord, this is your holy word. Lord, and you have spoken through James. Lord, open our eyes. Please enlighten our hearts that we may understand, that we may look at your words today, the words that give eternal life. And Lord, by that, that we may be encouraged. Lord, for some, that they may come to salvation. Lord, your word won't return to you empty. You promised. Thank you for that promise, Lord. Please use me now as I handle your word. Amen. If you guys like to keep bookmarks, you can also put bookmarks in at Job 28, Isaiah 47, and Matthew 5. So that's Job 28, Isaiah 47, and Matthew 5. Our text is James 3, verse 13 to 18. The outline of today's sermon is the nature and fruit of false wisdom. That would be verse 14 to 16 in James 3. Our second point is the nature and fruit of true wisdom. That's going to be verse 17 to 18. But before we get to that outline, I want to ask you a question by way of introduction. Do you truly have a working, saving faith? Is what you believe sufficient to keep you from eternal damnation? How do you know? This is a question all of us need to ask ourselves. Do I truly have a working, saving faith? You see, anything that truly has worth can be tested. The genuineness of a diamond can be tested. The genuineness of gold can be tested. And the genuineness of your faith can also be tested. Do you want to know whether you truly have working, saving faith? The book of James will help you answer this question. You see, we are physical beings in a physical world. We see things, hear things, smell things, taste things, we feel things. I mean, do you believe that the sky is blue? Why? Because you can see it, right? Do you believe that a feather is light? Why? Because you can feel it. But how do I know whether I truly have a working, saving faith? Can you touch God? Can you put your hand into His side like Thomas did? Can you physically see God? Can you look into one or another direction and see Him? Would you even know it was Him if you would see Him? Can you physically hear the sound of God's voice? Can you physically ask Him if you are saved and hear Him say, yes? John 4 verse 24 says, God is Spirit. By saying God is Spirit, John declares to us that God is invisible and untangible. 
You can't see him and you can't touch him. God being spirit also shows us that he isn't bound to be in a specific time or place. Do you see the problem? We are physical beings bound by space and time. We need something visible, something tangible, if we are to know whether we have a true, working, saving faith. The book of James will help you answer this question. And I want to encourage all of you to please read that book. In his book, James gives a series of tests to see whether you have this faith. Visible, tangible tests to see whether you are truly a child of God. How you persevere in suffering will test this. James 1, verse 2 to 12. Who you blame when you are tried will test this. James 1, verse 13 to 18. Your response to God's word will test this. James 1, verse 19 to 27. How you treat people will test this. James 2, verse 1 to 13. The works you do will test this. James 2, verse 14 to 26. How you speak will test this. James 3, verse 1 to 12. What you lust after will test this. James 4, verse 1 to 12. Who or what you trust will test this. James 4, verse 13 to 17. Your patience will test this. James 5, verse 1 to 11. Whether you're truthful will test this. James 5, verse 12. Your prayer life will test this. James 5, verse 13 to 18. You see, the genuineness of your faith can be tested. Today, James will be testing your faith by looking at your wisdom. In James 3, verse 13 to 18. Do you have a heavenly wisdom? Or do you have a hellish wisdom? That's the title of today's sermon. <coughs> heavenly wisdom and hellish wisdom. Verse 13 of James 3 reads, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. The book of James is classified by some as a wisdom document. This classification is based on the letter's proverbial style and the general moral tone. James, however, only refers to wisdom twice. In James 1 verse 5, where James exhorts his readers to ask for wisdom when they've been tried. And in our text for today, James 3 verse 13 to 18. James asks in verse 13, Who among you is wise in understanding? To understand what James is asking, we need to ask ourselves two questions. One, what is wisdom? And two, what is understanding? Let's look at question one. What is wisdom? The Greeks thought it was intellect and knowledge of divine things. The Hebrews, however, infused it with a much richer meaning of skillfully applying knowledge to life. Let me give you six definitions of wisdom I found amongst others. One, wisdom is the ability to cope. Two, it's experiential knowledge. Three, it's intellectual activity. Four, it's the legacy of parents to their children. Five, it's the capacity of judging rightly in matters relating to life and conduct. And six, wisdom is the quest for self-understanding and for mastery of the world. So as you can see, wisdom has a very broad meaning. Let's look at our second question. What is understanding? The word epistemenum is used only here in the New Testament. It refers to an intellectual perception and scientific acumen. It's being able to understand and evaluate. It's being knowledgeable in a way that makes one effectual in the exercise of that knowledge. So as you can see, these two words, wise and understanding, are very similar. Commentators actually say they are synonymous. 
I'd like to explain it as follows. Wisdom knows the good and how to do it. Understanding has seen wisdom in action and knows why it is good. So James is basically asking you, who is truly skilled in the art of living? Are you truly skilled in the art of living? Well, to master life, you'll need wisdom. And where do we find this wisdom? Well, a bunch of options. One, tradition. Right? We just did catechisms. It's a good tradition, for example, to read your Bibles at the dinner table. Much wisdom is imparted by that tradition. Two, by personal experience. You'll only pour petrol into a burning fire once. You'll only throw your freshly cut potato chips from the water to the hot oil once. Job 12 verse 12 says, Wisdom is with aged men. With long life is understanding. Wisdom is learned by personal experience. Three, where does wisdom come from? It comes from instruction. A father teaches his son how to build a fire. And a mother teaches her daughter how to cook. And I hope you do. Proverbs 19 verse 20 says, Listen to counsel and accept discipline, that you may be wise the rest of your days. Proverbs 21 verse 11 says, When the scoffer is punished, the naive becomes wise. But when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. You see, wisdom comes through instruction. But most importantly, where does wisdom come from? Fourthly, and most importantly, it's a divine gift. Wisdom is a gift of God. That's why Paul prays and asks in Ephesians 1 verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Turn with me to Job 28. Now you guys wish you put your good notes in there. Job 28. In Job 28, verse 1 to 15, we see a tremendous effort made by men to attain precious metals. It's hard to attain it, yet men do. They go down into the dark parts of the earth to get it. That's what verse 3 tells us in Job 28. They go where no one else does. They make shafts in valleys, verse 4 tells us. They overturn mountains, verse 9 tells us. They block rivers, verse 11 tells us. Yet, wisdom can't be found or bought. Verse 12 reads, But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? 13. Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says it is not in me, and the sea says it is not in me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. You see, no matter how hard men try, they can't find wisdom. But God, let's read Job 23, not 23, sorry, 28, verse 23. But God, God understands its way and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind and meted out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a pause for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and also searched it out. And verse 28 says, And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. God possesses wisdom. It is his. So it's very clear. Wisdom is a gift of God. James asks us, back in James 3, who is wise and understanding among you? Who has received this divine gift? Who is truly skilled in the art of living? Then, James commands us, still in verse 13, let him show by his good behavior and his deeds 
the gentleness of wisdom. If you've truly mastered life, James says, prove it. This challenge reminds us of James 2 verse 18, where it reads, But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Now show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James says, show it. This is something that manifests outwardly. It's visible, and it's tangible. He doesn't just say, prove it. He also tells you how. He says, by good behavior. This is your conduct. Your way of life. What you believe and what you possess are proven by your behavior. And not just your behavior, but also your deeds. What are you doing? What do you toil for? What do you put your energy into? You see, wisdom is not measured by degrees. You might have the highest grade in your class, children. But if you aren't obeying and honoring your parents, you are a fool. You might have read the exemplary husband, men. But if you aren't living with your wives in an understanding way, loving them and honoring them, you are a fool. You might have your doctorate in counseling, deacons, elders. But if you don't shepherd the sheep, then you are a fool. Wisdom is not measured by degrees. Wisdom is measured by deeds. It's not just acquiring truth in sermons. It's abiding in it. Jesus said, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. John 15 verse 8. James says, Are you claiming to be wise? Then show it. Prove it with your good works. But he goes further. You don't show your wisdom by being harsh, forceful, or demanding. If you are truly wise and understanding, it is shown in the gentleness of wisdom. This is the evidence. This word for gentleness can also be translated meekness. This wasn't the characteristic prized much by the Greeks. They actually thought of meekness as weakness. But it's not weakness. Jesus said, I am gentle. And Jesus isn't weak. In Matthew 5, verse 3, we read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those who are completely incapable of helping themselves. These blessed ones are in recognition of their complete worthlessness. But Matthew 5 verse 5 says, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Being poor in spirit is almost the same as being gentle. But where the poor in spirit recognizes his complete inability in and of himself, the gentle, the meek person, recognizes God's complete ability to enable him. Meekness is supreme self-control empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. It's God's power enabling man for God's glory. It's not the use of God's power to call down lightning from heaven upon unbelievers. It's the use of God's power for God's glory. And it always translates to others. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, which we all claim, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Don't go and fight with him. Don't go and hurt him. Ephesians 4 verse 1 to 2 says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Right? If you want to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called, listen to what Paul says, Ephesians 4 verse 2, 
with all humility and gentleness. So, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. And meekness is the right use of power. And these two go hand in hand. Are you truly skilled in the art of living? Then show it by your behavior and deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But, verse 14 starts with a but. And this brings us to our first point in our outline. That was only the introduction. One, first point in the outline, the nature and fruit of false wisdom. Verse 14 reads, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. It's easy to lie to ourselves and against the truth. How many times were you sure that you locked the front door? Yet, when you returned home, the door was unlocked. How many times were you sure you packed that thing in? Yet, you found it on the kitchen table as soon as you returned back home. You see, it's really easy to lie to ourselves and against the truth. But James gives us a test. A test so that we may know. The test is, what's your motive behind your so-called wisdom? Is it out of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition? In other words, is it against others? and for yourself. James says in verse 15 that this wisdom, this selfish, jealous wisdom, is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. Think about Satan for a second. I bet you he studied the scriptures as soon as they were canonized. But why? Was it to build others up? Or to tear them down? Was it for the glory of God and the humbling of self? It was out of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Remember those guys who proclaimed Christ in Philippians 1 verse 17 with the purpose to afflict Paul? That was out of bitter jealousy. They proclaimed the gospel. Remember the false teachers in 1 Timothy 6 verse 5? Who preached with a purpose to gain money? That was out of selfish ambition. This is something that's hard to discern. It's hard because our text says it's in the heart. And what do we know about the heart? What does Jeremiah tell us? It's desperately wicked and deceitful above all else, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. James says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, this is not me speaking, this is James, you can see it in the text. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. You know what's in your heart. God knows it too. If you harbor bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't be proud. And don't be a liar. Let me ask you three questions. Where does wisdom begin? Proverbs 1 verse 7. Wisdom begins with the knowledge or the fear of the Lord. Why? Why? Because you will see Him as He is. And if this happens, you will see yourself as you are. You are in spirit. You are completely unable without the help of the Lord. Third question. What will this wisdom produce? It will produce good behavior accompanied by good deeds done in meekness. If this isn't your reality, if this isn't your reality, do not be arrogant. And so lie against the truth. Knowing the Lord, who He is and what He did, produces a life that corresponds to the truth. A life that is truly lived, skillfully. 
The bitter and selfish heart that lies against the truth is not coming down from above, verse 15 says. In chapter 1, verse 17, James told us what comes down from above. James 1, verse 17 reads, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Good and perfect things come from above. Because every good and perfect thing comes from God who is perfect and who does good. Some commentator writes, Just as the evil of the tongue is set aflame by the evil of hell, verse 6, the good works of the wise are enlivened by the goodness of God. But this bitter and selfish wisdom has three characteristics which we find in verse 15. This hellish wisdom is, one, earthly, two, natural, and three, demonic. It's, a, it's an ascending order, ascending from bad to worse, ascending further and further away from God. Let's look at these three characteristics of Hellish wisdom. One, it's earthly. It's not heavenly. That means it has zero eternal value. It seeks its answers within the box, the box of creation. It uses microscopes and telescopes. It stares at creation trying to find wisdom. It attempts to calculate its way through the world by shifting shadows and of its natural lights and indeed even imitating them. It's bound with material and physical concerns. This wisdom is vulnerable to decay. It's philosophical and it's rational. It turns to psychology. It doesn't consider God's revealed will. It focuses on what makes the creature happy. Proverbs 14 verse 12 describes this wisdom perfectly. It says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This is hellish wisdom. Our second characteristic of hellish wisdom is its natural. It's not spiritual. It's devoid of the Spirit of God. It's like an animal. If it's, it's all driven by its passions. If it's hungry, it eats. If it's tired, it sleeps. The Greeks use this word to contrast bodily appetites with the life of the inner person. Rather than appropriating the perfect gifts of God and finding joy in the realities to come, this wisdom is self-centered and oriented to personal gain. This wisdom, let me rather say, this is a wisdom for a person or a self that is a law unto itself, approving and disapproving in an arrogant and autonomous way. This is that charismatic wisdom which is led about by feelings. It's like the false teachers in Jude 1 verse 19. Jude 1 verse 19 says, These, the false teachers, are the ones who cause divisions. They are worldly minded, same word, devoid of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he can, cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. You see, this. This natural wisdom, it's hellish wisdom. Our third characteristic of hellish wisdom is it's demonic. And it's not godly. It's satanic. It doesn't necessarily mean that this person is possessed by a demon. Okay? But he or she is certainly following Satan's schemes, whether they know it or not. Human interests serve satanic interests. When the course of one's life is so directed away from God, even when God is in one's superficial religious profession, the effects are demonic. Even the Apostle Peter fell in this trap. And do you remember what the Lord said to Peter in Matthew 16, 23? Let me help you. 
In Matthew 16, verse 16, Peter acknowledged who Jesus was. In verse 17 of Matthew 16, Jesus told him that this knowledge was not revealed to Peter by himself, but it was revealed to him divinely. Then in verse 21, Jesus prophesied about his suffering, death, and resurrection. Right? But Peter had a demonic agenda. Matthew 16, verse 22. Peter took him, Jesus, aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. You see, it's demonic in the sense that that is exactly what Satan would have hoped for. The devil didn't want Jesus to accomplish redemption for sins. Jesus told Peter in verse 23 of Matthew 16, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Jesus, in the most painful way, corrected Peter for serving the satanic by being so very human-centered in his interests. You see, human interests serve satanic interests. And this is hellish wisdom. These three adjectives, earthly, natural, demonic, serve as an important bridge to our next verse. James is now going to justify his harsh verdict. In verse 16, James says, For, for when jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is this order in every evil thing. If you have jealousy in your heart, that is, you are pained at someone else's good fortune, thinking it's something you deserve, there will be disorder in every evil thing. If you have selfish ambition in your heart, that is, doing whatever you do for yourself, there will be disorder in every evil thing. You see, our God is a God of order. That's why you guys have this. Our God is a God of order. Look at our solar system. If I may personify the sun, what do you think would happen if the sun, out of jealousy, decided to go and live in another galaxy, another solar system? Disorder, right? Let's look at our hydrologic cycle and personifying the sun again. What would happen if the sun was jealous of the moon and stopped producing its heat? Because it also wanted to be cool. <laughs> Disorder, right? Now let's look at the church. The church is a living organism. It's not an organization. It's an organism. It's alive. It has a head. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we all know how a chicken's body reacts when you remove its head. And unfortunately, that's exactly what we see when we look around us at churches who try and operate without its head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Irrational movements running in wrong directions. The church is a living organism. It has its head. And it has its members. Each, listen, each with a gift of grace as God has given it. What happens at the foot? out of jealousy, wants to be the mouth. Disorder. What happens if the mouth, out of selfish ambition, starts to tickle ears? Disorder. And not only disorder, but every evil thing. This doesn't suggest that every type of evil will be there, necessarily, but that all sorts of evil will be there. This is where you see churches become pragmatic, adjusting their services to invite the world in. This is where you see pastors commit immorality. This is where you see members divide and devour, divide and fight and devour one another. Galatians 5 verse 15. Where there is jealousy and selfish ambition, where there is hellish wisdom, you see churches where there is disorder and every evil thing. 
And all this starts with individuals. Individuals who use earthly wisdom, like philosophy and psychology. Individuals who use natural wisdom, only satisfying their own appetites. Individuals who use demonic wisdom, following the schemes of Satan. Schemes such as the WOF, or LGBTQZ, XYZ movement. Okay, these individuals are not truly skilled in the art of living. And they will show it by their behavior and by their deeds. Let's turn to Isaiah 47 and see an example of this kind of wisdom. This kind of hellish wisdom. Isaiah 47. This is a prophecy which speaks of the exalted position from which Babylon was about to fall. Isaiah 47 verse 8 says, Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures. That sounds like natural wisdom. Who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, or know the loss of children. These two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day. The loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure, in spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments. You felt secure in your wickedness, every vile practice. You felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. But evil shall come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. Disaster will fall upon you, for which you will not be able to atone. And ruin shall come upon you suddenly, of which you know nothing. Just order. Disorder because of these people. They follow their own wisdom and their own knowledge, according to verse 10. See, this is the nature and fruit of false wisdom. And that brings us to our second point in the outline. The nature and fruit of true wisdom. James 3 verse 17 reads, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. The word but contrasts this wisdom from the hellish wisdom just described to us in verse 14 and 16. This wisdom is heavenly wisdom. It's heavenly because it's from above. Coming down from the Father of lights. It's not found in the realm of creation. It's not earthly. It's not something that comes instinctively. It's not natural. It's not following the schemes of the devil. It's not the one. Verse 17 says, The wisdom from above is first pure. You see, like the true faith in chapter 2, verse 14 to 26, wisdom is identified by the type of life it produces. Did you hear that? Wisdom is identified by the type of life it produces. James 1, verse 18 says, In the exercise of His will, this is God, He brought us forth by the word of truth, so that, here comes the purpose, we would be a kind of first fruits amongst His creatures. Heavenly wisdom is first pure. First comes a washing. First comes a rebirth. First comes salvation. And all this comes from God. From your side, first comes hearing. First comes believing. First comes repenting. Only after this first act are you pure. The root word for pure is hagios in English that's holy. That's why the Lord elected us, according to Ephesians 1 verse 4, to be holy. To be pure. It's to be innocent. It's to be morally blameless. 
And you can only have this in Christ. You see, you first need to be washed and saved in Christ. And you first need to believe in Christ. Without this purity, which you only find in Christ, without Christ, you won't see the Lord. Matthew 5 verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Our text says, James, The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, and without hypocrisy. Purity is the source from which the following virtues flow. Can a blind man see? Can the dead react? Can a bad tree produce good fruit? See, without this purity, your best deeds are filthy rags. But if you are pure, if you have been washed, if you have believed, then the following virtues will follow. These seven qualities are specific dimensions of this overall purity. And we can look at these qualities and prove whether we truly have a working, saving faith. The first three, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, start with the same letter in Greek and end with the same letters. Okay? They form our first group. Now let's look at each of them. One, peaceable. This person protects unity. This piece stands opposite to the disorder we just looked at in verse 16. Proverbs personifies wisdom and says, in Proverbs 3 verse 17, her, that's wisdom, her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. Proverbs 16 verse 7 says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Does that describe you? Is your purity manifesting in a characteristic of peace? Our second quality of heavenly wisdom is it's gentle. The person who is peaceable will be gentle. And this is to be considerate, kind, sensitive. It's a sweet, reasonable it's not to insist on every right of letter, law, or custom. This gentleness stands opposite to the selfish ambition in verse 16. It puts its own interests aside. It has a willingness to yield to others and a corresponding unwillingness to exact strict claims. Paul actually requires that overseers be like this in 1 Timothy 3 verse 9. Are you gentle? Is your purity manifesting in a characteristic of gentleness? Our third quality of heavenly wisdom is it's reasonable. This person is teachable and easily persuaded. This person willingly submits to God's will and is willing to yield when it doesn't matter. Nabal was not a reasonable man. In 1 Samuel 25 verse 17 we read that Nabal is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. No one can speak to him. Does that describe you? Or does your purity manifest in a characteristic of reasonableness? That's the first three of the seven qualities. Our second group is brought together by the word full. Okay, it's not half full. Full is full. It's a boundary. This heavenly wisdom is thoroughly characterized by mercy and good fruits. You see, what you are full of controls you. Our fourth quality is mercy. This is someone who's quick to forgive. He doesn't always get what is due. This person is also concerned with others who are in pain. 
It's a key indicator of a godly person. Matthew 5 verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. In James 2 verse 13, it says, Judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Are you merciful? Did the mercy that made you pure also make you merciful? Our fifth quality of heavenly wisdom is good fruits. If mercy was the cause, then good fruits are the effect. It's opposite to the vile practices in verse 60. <clears throat> I'm going to say it again. What you are full of controls you. Matthew 7, verse 17 to 19, famous verses, says, Every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. It's not hard to understand. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I ask children this. Small children. And I ask them, does a bad tree bear good fruit? They look at me like I'm crazy. And yet, when I speak to grown-ups who are wise, looking through their telescopes and microscopes, putting with their degrees on their wall, then they want to come with their worldly wisdom and explain to me why a bad tree can produce good fruits, or why a good tree who's not producing fruits is actually it's a good tree. You see, it's objective. It's visible. It's tangible. Our third group, our third group of the seven qualities is brought together by being negative. Now you see in Greek, when a word gets an A, an alpha, as a prefix, it negates the word. Okay? That means it makes it negative. It's like the un in English, like an unbeliever. Okay? Theos is God. Okay? And then A, Theos. Okay. Now you guys know Greek. Okay? But a negative isn't always negative in the sense of being bad. Okay. Being unworldly isn't bad. It's good. Our third group is a negative group, but these negative qualities are good. Okay, Sixth quality of heavenly wisdom is it's unwavering. It's to be without doubting. It's consistent in convictions and behavior. This person doesn't change. His yes is his yes, and his no is his no. He's not like the one who doubts in James 1 verse 6. He's not like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Our seventh quality, and last of our qualities, is it's without hypocrisy. This person is sincere and authentic. He is a church who is at home. He has a singleness of heart. He is true to his being. And he isn't playing a part. See, these seven qualities are specific dimensions of the overall purity. And they take us back to verse 13 in James 2. James asked, who is wise and understanding among you? And the answer is, those who are pure. And because of their purity, they show these seven qualities. Don't forget, heavenly wisdom comes from above, right? It's not found in the box of creation. It's not something that comes instinctively. Anyone who has children knows that. It is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. You see, like the hellish wisdom produces after its own character, so does heavenly wisdom. And, James says in verse 18, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is how you can see if someone is truly skilled in the art of living. This is how it is proven. If you are truly wise and understanding, if you are truly wise and understanding, then you will be making peace. This is the good works that result from salvation. Like God who is good, produces good. Like God who is merciful, produces mercy. 
So those who have received peace will make peace. Peace is both the man and the means. And what is the ultimate peace? Peace with God. Peace with God. You see, you need to share the gospel. You need to warn people of the wrath to come. You need to tell them the good news about Jesus. Who lived, died, rose again to pay for sins of those who would believe. Please believe. I beg you believe. Come. Today. While you can. Please. Please. If you do this, don't do it through fights and quarrels. Do it in peace. Do this and you will see people be reconciled unto God. People will have peace with God. And they will start bearing fruit of righteousness. I've seen that. One of them is sitting in that room, feeding my kid. That is the nature and fruit of true wisdom. So are you wise in understanding? Do you truly have working, saving faith? Then you need to pass this test that God has set before you today. You need to show it by your behavior in deeds of gentleness. Are you truly skilled in the art of living? Then stop being jealous. Start rejoicing at other people's good fortune. Start being grateful for what you have and what you don't have. Start remembering who you are in light of God's revealed word. Start by regarding others as more important than yourself. Are you truly skilled in the art of living? And stop being selfish. Start thinking of other people's needs. Start considering how you can serve one another. Start giving instead of wanting to receive. Start praying for other people instead of only praying for yourself. Are you truly skilled in the art of living? Stop being earthly. Start seeking your answers from the God of creation and not the creature. Psychologists and philosophers don't have the answers. Stop being natural. Start saying no to your flesh. Eat less, sleep less. Start disciplining your body and don't let sin reign in it. Are you skilled in the art of living? Then stop being demonic. Start learning what God says about man, sexuality, justice, what God says about the church. Start discerning between the wisdom from below and the wisdom from above. Do you have heavenly wisdom? Improve it by grounding your truth with good claims in the Word of God. Seek the answers to your problems in Holy Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17, which I hope you all know, says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Do you struggle with depression? Do you struggle with anxiety? Do you struggle with lust, greed? Name it. God's word has the answer. So that you may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Do you have heavenly wisdom? Prove it by obeying God's commands and instructions found in his word. 1 John 4 verse 6 says, We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who does not he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Obey God. And lastly, do you have heavenly wisdom? Then prove it by proclaiming the truth and making peace. You see, a mouth filled with praise results in a mind filled with purity. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior 
his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. Let's pray. Lord, who can stand? They are in front of you. Lord, we have all fallen so short. Lord, we have all sinned against your holy name. And yet, Lord, while we were your enemies, you came. You came to make peace with us. Lord, please help us believe. Help us trust in your holy name. Help us trust in what you did through your son, becoming a man, living a perfect life, which we didn't do. Dying a death that we all deserve, Lord. Lord, and conquering death, which we would never be able to do. Lord, help us to believe and trust in you. Lord, help us to discern our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful. Lord, and I don't want anyone here today to walk away after they have seen themselves in the mirror of your word, to walk away and forget what they have seen. Lord, but for that to happen, we need you. We need you to work in people's hearts, to shine the light of your truth in their dark hearts. Lord, to change hearts. Lord, to change minds. Lord, to the glory of your holy name. Lord, we are looking forward to see what you are going to do with this wisdom that you have imparted to us. Please help us, Lord, to live a pure, gentle, peaceful way with other people. Lord, to love them as you have loved us, not because we were worthy, Lord. Lord, we aren't worthy. But you loved us. Lord, help us to love like that. And to give like you have. 